Ah, that looks really cute. Oh, I love it! Welcome to the Photography Podcast with your host, Mike Cassidy. Hey, how are you, everybody? My name is Mike Cassidy, and I'm a boudoir photographer from New Jersey, and this is my show. What I do is talk with people who are just starting out on their photography voyages, as well as established pros to learn about the hurdles they've had to overcome to get their businesses going. I'm looking to bring you personal stories, which will help you connect to the fact that you're not alone in your struggles. Along the way, we'll probably have a few laughs, but the goal is to get you some actionable advice to help your business grow. So stay tuned. You never know what you may learn. Oh, hello. How are you? My name is Michael, and I am your neighbor. It's December, and... You're in the photography business, you're probably fairly busy. I had a very busy November, busy December, and working on a lot of sessions, doing a lot of editing, getting a lot of Christmas photo albums together, and it's a busy time. And inevitably, you know, you're, I haven't missed a Christmas yet, and I'm not going to start this year, and you're always like seemingly chasing down one or two people to the very bitter end, and they're not answering your text messages or emails, and... They're just going on oblivious that if they don't do what they need to do at that moment, their Christmas gifts are going to be late. And uh, so it can be stressful, but it's a lot of fun to do. And it's a lot of fun to know you're giving these people these great gifts and it's going to give them a lot of happiness and joy through the year. So in the end, all that all that hard work is uh, is well worth it. But it's nice to take a break tonight to work on the podcast a little bit. Uh, I haven't had too much time to do it uh, lately and... Hopefully, we'll be back on track a little bit, and I have a bunch of episodes I want to start releasing, and probably not till after Christmas or, or, or January. I don't know exactly yet what my schedule is going to be, whether it's going to be every two weeks or once a month. I'm going to sort of uh, take that a little bit day by day and, and see how that goes, how it works for me, and what the response uh, to everybody uh, listening so far. It's been very positive, so we're going to keep on working on this for a while. And so tonight, we have a real great, super smart woman, Kiana, from Kiana Marie Photography, and we had a great chat a couple of weeks ago, and uh, um, not only is she a boudoir photographer, she is a wedding photographer, and all other types of photography that she does, and she's doing a really great job, and the one thing about her is that she really separates herself by focusing on experiences you know she offers a lot more than just a photo you know and she's got to figure it out in that respect which in turn helps her earn more money brings her more business so this is definitely an episode you want to stick around and listen to her we talk for maybe i don't know 50 minutes or an hour and there's a lot of good information in here for people to listen to. So I learned some stuff. Hopefully you'll learn some things. And so uh, stick around and listen. And, um, you know, I'll stop talking now and probably be back after the New Year's, January sometime. So happy holidays. And uh, here's uh, the episode with Kiana. Okay, so you are on. You are live. You ready to go? I'm ready. Okay. I am with Kiana Sanchez today from Kiana Marie Photography. So, Kiana, take a moment to introduce yourself to everybody. Good morning. Thank you so much. So, yeah, so I'm Kiana, and I am a destination wedding and boudoir photographer, educator, motivator, all the things. I am just obsessed with turning your passions into profits and um, really taking your business to the next level without losing sight of why you got started and why you fell in love with your craft in the first place. So I am, I'm actually based in two places and two locations at this time. I am serving the Bay Area, so the San Francisco Bay Area in California, as well as expanding to the like Scottsdale, Phoenix area in Arizona. I am expanding. Um, I have big, big dreams. Um, however, I am also like a destination photographer. So anywhere 
you want to take me? I'm ready for the ride. So I'm excited. How, how far is that apart? Like how far is going back and forth from, I say I'm on the East Coast. Is that, so you're doing a lot of driving or a lot of flying? It'll, going be, a lot of, it'll be a lot of flying. So the wow. flight itself is only about an hour and 45 minutes. It's less than two hours. Um, but if all the traffic in California, it's it sometimes I can go back and forth. <laughs> two and a half <laughs> days. You could, walk, you could walk faster than you can drive. Exactly. Yeah. And I was looking at your website a little bit and you look very busy. Just from even looking at your website, you look like you're very busy. Like I said, we'll get in. You're involved in the education part of it, the photography part of it. So it looks like you have a lot uh, going on. So we're going to try to touch a little bit about each of those those topics. Um, but first, what I want to do is go back in time a little bit. I like to talk to everybody about how they started, what was the genesis of the idea, and then sort of what came first, the wedding part of it or your your boudoir part of it. So mm-hmm. let's go back in time, Kiana. Let's yeah. go back just for a moment. <laughs> Here we go. We're traveling back in time. Ooh, I love it. I love okay. it. We're setting so a vibe. How... What was the genesis or where, what was your inspiration when you first started to get into, into photography? Yeah. So when I first started, I, like my goal was to be your family photographer. So I wanted to encompass everything. I just had a love for people. I had a love for milestones and connections. So I just shot everything. So in a perfect world and like my perfect ideal client would be engagement sessions, weddings, including boudoir. And then of course comes the baby bump next. And I would shoot everything. I would shoot baptisms. I shoot first birthday cake smashes. I did it all. And it wasn't until I started, like after I graduated from San Jose state and I started really pursuing this, a lot of the education out there for photographers really pushed special, like specialization. It was, if you're going to be good at one thing in photography, you need to be the best and you need to drop newborn photography. You need to drop all these other things and you need to focus on one specific niche or niche. And, um, I had a really hard time with that because I liked everything. And so what I started to do was I started to push towards more weddings because that's where my heart just felt like I was pulled to be. And, um, so then encompassing the wedding portion, that's when I really honed in on engagement shoots, boudoir photography, and, um, and kind of maintaining these clients. So once they do become a wedding client for me, or, you know, they're part of the Keanu Marie couples and they become Keanu Marie brides. Um, you moved them through your funnel from one group to the next group yes. to the next group. Yeah. Yes. And then what was awesome too, is I started noticing that with these weddings, because I had put so much effort into kind of doing all the things like hashtag everything, mm-hmm. I, I started attracting bridesmaids that would soon become brides. And I started attracting flower girls that I would see at my mini sessions. And, um, so it all kind of, like you said, it just it funneled into just this kind of like wedding tribe is the best way to describe mm-hmm. it. <laughs> So the wedding part really, I guess, started to to come first, or or yes. or, and so did, well, I guess you you were just advertising for weddings, or did someone come to you and say, hey, you know, we're getting married, you mind coming over and and photographing my wedding this weekend, or was, yeah. was it really a concerted effort to go out there and start marketing to that to that group? It it happened pretty naturally, um, and to be perfectly honest, my brother actually, it sounds ridiculous, but he was like my biggest pimp for finding me weddings, so all of his friends were starting to get married off, and he would he would tell his buddies like, oh, just trust me, my sister takes really good pictures, and at first it was kind of like, okay, Mike, yep, mm-hmm, yep, but soon they started seeing that I would show up and I would be so passionate about my work, and helping with their days and not just being a photographer, but being like an honorary bridesmaid and, and helping with so much more than just actually snapping photos. And quickly that's how it grew where it was just like word of mouth and it word was of mouth. Mm-hmm, friends of friends. And, um, so to, to this date, my brother has actually been in the most weddings I photographed and he has brought the most weddings, um, to date. It's crazy. <laughs> now, I guess in this case, because it probably came through your brother, but do you remember the first wedding you photographed? Was it a disaster or how did that go? Do you remember that? uh, Oh, no, absolutely. uh, So, well, okay. The very, very first wedding I photographed, I was a second shooter and that's when I got a taste of it. And I thought, oh my God, I cannot believe that this could be my life. Like this could be my job. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that triggered everything. It, It wasn't, I was just kind of like being a helper. And like second shooter before second shooters were even really a thing back then. And, um, and then it wasn't until I did my first, very, my very first wedding. And, um, there was like an uncle Bob situation where 
it was a, a family friend of ours. It was actually my brother was the best man in this wedding. And he, uh, the, the uncle Bob person, he like, he was just like kind of helping. Like he did, he wasn't like contracted to be there or anything like that. He was just helping and giving you a hand. Yes. And then I was there as well. Um, so I think I, I was just trying to push it and just trying to like conquer the whole day and take care of everything. And just, I mean, I knew nothing back then. Like I knew but nothing. But you made it through. Somehow we you did, made it through. We did. Um, but yeah, it was definitely an experience that I'll never forget. But mm. I mean, even today, it's some of those images are some of my favorite images. Really? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it's, you know, and you, when you were talking a little bit earlier about being a generalist when it comes to photography, I think, um, you know, people, and I mostly, my work is mostly all boudoir. And once in a while, I'll have women that come in and say, oh, you know, would you photograph my wedding? You did. And I'm like, I don't want to go near a wedding. I don't know anything <laughs> about it. You know, it seems like there's a certain, like in, in boudoir, there's a certain group, core group of photos. It seems like in weddings, there's got to be a certain core group of photos that brides expect you to do. And unless you know those, you could be missing out on something. And then there's no going back to sort of to go back to get those shots. So did you do a lot of homework or do a lot of research to say, ooh, we have to do this, we have to do this, we have to do this shot? Or did you just go in there and kind of like see what happens? Yeah. So when I, when I first started, it was just, to me, it was a matter of covering everything. So I, it sounds kind of sick to think of it this way, but I was almost like a forensic photographer. <laughs> like that's how I, every, I put, every 800,000 photos you were taking, yes. just everything. Yeah. I was just shot, like just shooting everything. And then, but to me personally, and this is why I was so drawn to photography in general was because I am just such a sucker for milestone and I like milestones and I am just like a hopeless romantic. I love love. And so just having the camera and being able to just capture those moments, that to me was it. And it sounds so cliche and it sounds so cheesy, I know, but it's true. Like I I just, I, I had to be at the right place at the right time. And, um, but I, I did, like I did do my research. I attended a lot of weddings. I have a huge family. So I've been in a lot of weddings. I understand mm -hmm. like the traditions and the flows. That really helped. So you paid attention. You knew kind of what was going on when you get in there because I, that's a, you know, to me, that's always like a scary business. It would seem on your first wedding or two, because again, crazy brides, so much pressure and people have certain expectations. And if you roll in there and don't do so good, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that are, are angry at you. And it's not like a business where I guess, you, well, I don't know if you can practice or not. You know, I don't know if you could do fake weddings to, to kind of to practice these, but it's you're you're live. You know, there's no, not a lot of rehearsal with that. So I imagine that's super stressful for anybody getting started as a as a wedding photographer because um, you're thrown into the fire right from the get go. And I think, you know, what you did as being a second shooter, I think that's how you have to do it, you know, to get experience, see what's going on and then. And then to make that, uh, and then to make that leap. So as you were going in weddings, I guess that business started to grow from you from referrals. So from that came, I guess you said you were doing engagement photography and, and maternity photography from those clients. Yep, exactly. It started from them, and then quickly, um, people were noticing. Um, just my images being up everywhere and wanting to be a part of that, wanting to help either support me um, and just, you know, I kind of forced it on a lot of people at first. <laughs> and then um, and then soon people were just reaching out and it just it, it just grew. It just it just through word of mouth. It really helped. Now, me. at what point, you know, and this is, I think, something a lot of people go through at first is exciting and, and, and it's fun and you can't believe you're going out and, and doing these jobs. But at some point, reality kind of sits in, sinks in. And you're sitting home and you're like, wow, I have like 2000 photos in front of me and this takes me hours and hours and hours and I got to be start getting something from my time doing this, you know, you have bills, rent and mortgages and all kinds of stuff like this. So was there a point or tell me a little bit about when you were getting involved in this wedding businesses where you start to think a little bit more, hmm, I'm really kind of actually pretty good at this. Maybe I can get more or maybe I can get more here. Is there a time when you start saying, you know, I'm really busy, I'm raising my prices? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. And that happened pretty quickly once because I still had a full time job. Um, in fact, when I started my business, I was I was still in school and I had two jobs plus uh, trying to take photos on the side. Mm -hmm. So at one point I thought, I can't do this. Um, so the moment I realized, okay, like I need to start charging more was when I was working a full-time job and I just, I couldn't take any more dentist appointments. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm doing air quotes. I know you can't see me, but <laughs> I couldn't do any, um, any dentist appointments. I couldn't have any more sick days. And it started really interfering with, like my business was kind of growing like wildfire and it kind of was interfering with my, my day-to-day -day job. Yeah. 
And to be perfectly honest, and I mean, I'll just talk normals and be really transparent. When I was working my, uh, my desk job, I was making, if I was lucky, tw- like $2,000 a month, like $2,500 a month. Um, and I just thought, oh my God, I can charge this in one wedding. Like one wedding would pay 40 hours worth of my time just sitting at a desk that I just didn't feel fulfilled and I didn't feel happy. And so that's when I started making that shift. I'm like, okay, how do I start charging more for this? How do I get more people on the calendar and just kind of like let this actually like turn this hobby into my profession? And there was a turning point where I was just, and it turned into dollar signs. I was like, this is not a hobby anymore. Like I enjoy this. And if I don't start getting paid for what I do and really getting that return, um, I'm going to hate it and I'm not going to enjoy it. And, um, so that's when it started like having a little turning point. Yeah. And that becomes real pressure because then you have to start booking these jobs. And I think that's what a lot of people struggle with. Well, now if I charge more, maybe I'm not going to do as much work. And it's, it's very stressful to, to make that leap. And I applaud anybody who, who, who does that. And not only that, I think the wedding photography business is particularly competitive. I know out in the East coast it is again, I, I don't know too, too much about, you know, that's not really my thing, but what is that atmosphere like out there as far as differentiating, differentiating, yourself from the rest of the people trying to compete for that for that slice of the pie honestly I am I don't know if it's just me and <laughs> but it's I'm in this bubble um well we're just very fortunate to have such an incredible um just like vendor relationships where I have a handful of photographers that I love and trust and they are I mean, the purest Webster dictionary definition of competition they are my competition but we get along. We share. We share referrals. We help each other book calendars. Um, there are clients that come along that um, maybe having a special request, like maybe they've either met me at a wedding or they came from a referral of a referral, and they uh, they may have a, like a request for a more of a dark and moody photographer or maybe something that's not quite your style. Yeah. Yep. And then yeah. we just we refer them. Um, I personally believe, and this is just me maybe living under my rainbow cloud, but. I believe the market is what you make of it. So if you find yourself like competing um, for these leads and just being in a, like a cutthroat environment, personally, I think that's on you. Like you need a reality check because there are really nice people out there um, that do want to help. And um, special thanks to, to um, the rising tide society. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, um, with this big movement. Um, Yeah. And so we believe in um, community over competition and uh, it really has set me up for success knowing that, um, you know, healthy competition is good. You know, of course you do want to be the best and you want to, you do need to pay your bills. But at the end of the day, when you, you lead your business with a full heart and you're excited to, um, to share your accomplishments and to share leads and um, really push each other, we all can charge more. We all, and it's not even about the money, but it's all we can all live the best life and um, and definitely make a difference. Like it doesn't have to be this cutthroat um, situation. And I, I feel like it's definitely like the climate is what you make of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's an interesting situation. I'm not aware of anything um, like that out here, but you're right. In essence, I guess their philosophy is the rising tide lifts all the boats. So you have mm-hmm. a bunch of people sort of working together to get each other, each other business. But I think even still what, you need to do, especially in the wedding business, because there's so many people. And and, and again, I'm not super into that here, but it seems like a very price competitive industry out here. You still find instances of people that are just getting into the business, trying to undercut people, or what's it like, or do you get approached by brides or, or a couple saying, well, you know, you're charging X, but the other person over here is charging me so much less. If you want to give me your business, then, you know, you're going to charge what they're going to charge. Do you get any of that kind of back and forth from, from brides? Um, I do. Um, I would say not so much anymore since I have been increasing my prices and um, kind of moving into a little bit more like a luxury market, but it still happens. People still try to find me. And if that's the case, and this is me speaking 10 years in business. If, mm. if I was one, two, three years in business, I would yeah. totally, I'd be like the Walmart and like price match and all those mm. things. Um, but to be perfectly honest at this point in time, when that does happen, I just tell them, okay, thank you so much. Like, I wish you the best of luck. Here are other, um, photographers that are maybe in your budget. Um, and, and I wish them luck. And then I also provide a list of, um, other vendors that I love to work with as well. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm still helping them, but if they're price shopping me, 
and they are um, like, we you know, wanting to be competitive with their prices that they're not my client. Like they, they don't love me for me. They're not looking for uh, an experience that I provide on their wedding day in their entire life. Um, it's more just uh, someone to show up and take photos. And there are other photographers that are well equipped to do that. And, and I send them their way. Yeah, that's that's tough to do. I think at first, that's something that comes. I think with maturity and and growing in your in your niche because immediately you, the idea of turning away money or turning away business is is really is really tough for people. And I and I think they struggle. And I think that's one measure that you've sort of you know, have evolved to this next step or when you can confidently say to someone, you know, thanks, but no thanks. I understand your need, but there may be somebody, you know, that may be better suit your, your budget and, and your, uh, and what you guys are, are looking for. And so are you, I guess in, in your case, and you're, you're traveling so much, you have to bundle in this airfare and all this travel time, uh, to go from one state to, to another, if you're traveling around. So, uh, how does that factor in? Is that, is that part of your prices? Or I guess that has to go when someone contacts you, you have to find out what their destination is. And then you're, you're, you're adding that all into the final costs. Yes. Yes. Well, so also again, to be totally transparent, this is all very new. 2020 will be my very first year that I am doing like the dual traveling. Yes. The dual travel. Um, so I am trying to bundle my stuff. A lot of my leads are still coming from California and Northern mm. California, Mm. Napa Valley, Bay Area. And, um, but I am set up with my pricing where I don't charge an additional fee if you are based in the Bay Area in or the area. Arizona. Yeah. Um, if you do need to, you know, hop you on, you know, get me on a plane and, and take me to, you know, take me to Italy or take me to Mexico and Hawaii, um, there are definitely travel. Um, and I know. think people would understand that, yeah. you know, if there's a, like a, a list that you have and, and I think that's great, especially in in wedding photography, because people, you know, for whatever reason, are drawn to a particular style, and they they find somebody's work, and then they'll they'll you know if it's in their budget to fly, hey, why not go for a free trip, yeah, you know, to uh, uh, to Europe. So that's interesting, and I think that's another landmark uh, in a career as a wedding photographer when people start bringing you places to photograph their their wedding. I think that's a, an exciting thing to do. A little bit of traveling probably can get tiring after a while if you're if you're if you're busy. But that's definitely, I think, a mark that you've reached a another level a level when people are wanting you to go halfway around the world with them to, so to capture that that moment. Even more stress, I think that would add even more stress to the uh, uh, to the whole uh, situation with the wedding. So, what you mentioned a bit before, you you have to differentiate yourself in photography. I think there's so much noise. There's so many people at the bottom, and and sometimes you have to start to raise above that. And then the air is a little bit clearer. And you definitely said that at this point you're trying to go a little bit more upmarket and not getting, I don't want you to get too much into the details here, but like, where would you say are like the different strata where you are? Like what is considered like low, medium or high and, and what differentiates, do you think, the different levels of photographers? Um, okay, wait, question. Are you talking about like financially, like pricing for low? Yeah, I mean, like when just in, in, in a brief, like out there, what do you think is like the upper range? And, and what do you think that, you know, when someone's going for a $10,000 wedding, what really separates that from like a $3,000 wedding? And is it just the quality of the work or, or what goes along with, with making those big jumps in, in pricing? Yes, I think, um, well, I can tell you like stuff for two hours talking about this topic. Mm. Um, but I think the first thing that comes to mind really boils down to experience and uh, experience, communication, and honestly, your people skills. Um, I feel like this is really important where a lot, I feel like a lot of photographers, and this is me just being totally general and maybe stereotypical, but a lot of photographers hop into this business because they, they think that, oh gosh, photographers make so much money. I can do this. It's going to be a quick buck. Yeah. It's going to be a quick buck. And to be perfectly honest, it's not. Um, it can be very lucrative if your heart and soul is in it. Um, but I think what really sets the um, like the standard or maybe like kind of creates those levels of photographers, whether you're charging $2,500 or $10,000, um, really boils down to experience. Um, knowing that you can provide, um, consistency in your work. Um, I feel like that is something that's huge. So no matter if you're on a cliff in Yosemite, or if you are in a barn, or if you are, um, in, you know, these dark places, it doesn't matter. Like your work will speak for itself. Um, but at the end of the day, like it's, it, it's just, I don't know. There's so many things I can say about it. <laughs> There's so many things, but definitely experience is up there. Cause you're is up there. Mm -hmm. Like who's your typical person? Like what would you say is the, your typical client that comes to you? Um, 
uh, looking for you to hire you in a wedding in the wedding business? Um, for me, it's it's kind of across the board. So I get I get young couples um, in their early twenties, all the way up to couples um, that are um, in their my gosh, like mid thirties. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, honestly, I I try to attract couples that um, that. They love natural light. They love experiences. And at the end of the day, they might like nice things, but they'd rather invest in experiences. They want to give their, like, as much as I love Pinterest photos and um, all the beautiful inspiration that it has for that, um, my couples really push for creating an experience that their families and that their friends are really going to love and not just putting on this, like, dramatic show or this, like, broad, you know, this Broadway movie. Um, right, and right. And that, to me, is where I can make those connections with families and, and create that longevity in um, returning customers and business. It sounds like you're trying to create a very personal experience, you know, yes. in, in these events, not just the photos, but just sort of, you know, just making a little bit, uh, a little bit more than that. And I was looking through your photos again before you do have a, a very unique style uh, to your photos. It's very attractive. It's really good. Thank you. Um, you know, so anybody that's listening definitely should go over on your website and take a little bit of a look at your work and we'll get back. We'll go to that a little bit more in the uh Um, in the future, but yeah. And then how did you transfer or, or move into boudoir photography? Was that again, from your, your, the wedding business where you're brides and they, they wanted to suddenly do a a boudoir shoot and you're like, I'll do it. That's honestly exactly how it happened. So I noticed a a calling for, um, some of my brides that wanted to gift this and, um, Okay, so I don't know if you know, um, so Jessie James Decker, she did a boudoir shoot, um, and she's just this, like, country artist, singer, and um, she did one, and as soon as she did that, I had a handful of my girlfriends text me, call me, I mean, they were like, Key, we need to do one of these, can you please Mm. photograph this for us? And I, so of course, I watched her show, it was James and Jess, or, or, um, no, sorry, it wasn't James and Jess, it was, um, her and her husband had this um, like reality TV show on E, and so we watched the show together. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can I can recreate these, and that's kind of how it started. Um, I took a little a quick workshop on um, boudoir photography where I had a beautiful model, um, and it wasn't too much like directed education for these boudoir shoots, um, but mostly just just providing a gorgeous studio florals and um, like the whole experience for um, boudoir. And so once I photographed those and shared those, that's when it really started picking up. And, and I started um, not so much pushing it for my brides, but um, definitely once I started posting more about it, they got excited and it kind of fell into place there. Is that something that is part of your bridal packages or no, that's just separate and people will get that in addition to it's separate. Um, and part of the reason why I keep it separate is for the privacy for my brides, because a lot of times they do want to keep it a secret for their fiance. And so yeah, they, it's, don't, yeah. Yeah, they don't even want to see it like in the, the package collections or options. And so it's secret. But yeah. Yeah. And that's the one thing about being in the boot. Your whole life is a secret existence. Everything you do is secret emails, secret text messages, secret phone calls. Your whole life is a lie. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's true. Right. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, that I, that makes sense because when you're looking with your fiance at a wedding, you can't be anything ever about boudoir. Yeah, yeah, it, has yeah. To be, it has to be a whole separate um, um, existence. So where where are you doing your your boudoir work? Uh, do you have a studio, or you're doing these in in hotel rooms, or 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 do you have a uh, just in in your home, someone somewhere in the clients' homes? So when I first started, I did start in my home. I started in my bedroom. I'd like rip everything out of my room, keep it really simple and clean. And then um, I would have couples or sorry, I would have brides and um, and girls that would book a hotel room. And then when I started doing so, what I really started creating was a niche for mini sessions. So I, I call them petite boudoir shoots. And one of the first one I hosted was, oh, my gosh, like five or six years ago. And what I did is I actually rented two hotel suites. Um, and so they were right next door. And one would be kind of like the holding room for hair and makeup. And we had snacks and champagne and strawberries. And then the next room was, the, of course, the more private um, kind of studio room where we took our photos. And then I also have um, a local studio that I uh, just rent on a daily, rent daily when you basis. need it. Mm-hmm. Ah, it's yeah, so you, the work, yeah, the work is very pretty that you do um, um, with the brides. And see, you're, 
I'm more along the lines of doing my photos as that bright and pretty kind of a look. You know, there are some photographers that have that dark and moody black and white, which just isn't my thing. I can't do that that very well. Um, but you seem to fall in the, the category along with the style that I do. And is that sort of just uh, your vision of how boudoir should be? Or how did you arrive at that that style or that look? Uh, great question. So I I actually prefer a bit more the feminine light and airy um, look for a lot of my photography, a lot of my style. Um, but at the same time, too, one of my like rules for my style is to be very natural. I am a huge advocate for keeping things really naturally lit, very clean, very bright, um, because personally, that's that's how I see it. Like that's what it to me looks what that's what it looks like in real life. And um I feel like a lot of photographers sometimes get caught up in edits and presets and styles and right, um right. it's too much. It's too much. And for me, I I mean I think it's art and I think it can be very beautiful, but I am looking for that timeless classic look. Um and I feel like going natural, like you can never go wrong with that. Yeah, and I agree with you there. And, you know, there's no right or wrong answer to this. There's like there's no right or wrong best flavor in ice cream. You know, everyone, someone likes strawberry, that's great, or vanilla, that's great. But I think, too, I, I think we live in a day and age of too much editing and, and filters and, and presets. And even though in the moment that may be a great look, it's one of those things that four or five years from now you're looking back and you're like, Ew, you know, maybe that was a bit too much. And what was I thinking mm -hmm. in doing that? So I don't know. I personally, I'm in, in more align with, with your style and keeping it simple, keeping it pretty, keeping it, keeping it natural. And I think that you get more mileage from that. And I think uh, the people seem to like that uh, better too. I think it suits more, more uh, types of clients than, than a particular, you know, honing in on a single look. And so Kiana, if I want to come in with you for a boudoir session, how does that all come down? How are you operating? Do you have multiple packages or what's the process when I want to come with you and do a session? Are you an album woman? Are you a digital photo woman? How, how are we doing this? How does this work? So I offer a couple different options. Um, I do offer a much, like a much more affordable option where I, I'll host those, like they call them the petite boudoir sessions. Mm. Um, and so that is that is like over less than half a price of the, the full Regular. boudoir, yes, the boudoir thing, um, which is awesome for my brides specifically. Like I actually get a lot of my brides on these petite days uh, because they're already spending a buttload of money on their wedding. Right. They don't, Weddings and, are expensive. Yeah. And a lot of times too, like it is a secret. So they, you know, they can, they can hide about 400 bucks a little bit easier than a $1,200 mm. purchase um, yeah. from their fiance. Or, right. um, but yeah. And so I, I like offering them a variety of options, whether they include full glam, like full hair and makeup. I have a, a handful of makeup artists that I love and trust that um, come in for a discounted rate um, to really give them that like goddess experience and make mm. them feel like a million. That's times. important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The transformation is incredible. So I definitely encourage that. Um, eyelashes are life. And then um, and then I also offer um like albums. So for me personally, everything I do in my business, I try to think of, okay, so when I'm a bride one day, what is it that I'm going to want? So everything, everything ran in my business is that way. Um, so for example, um, everything is super private. Everything is like on lockdown. So although it is kind of scary to say like, yes, your images are online. Um, but I make it clear to say that, um, you know, they're, they're not shared on social until I have written proof from you. Um, but I do provide an online gallery, um, and it's set up like it's, it's a pixie set gallery. So, um, so for those not familiar, it's just kind of like a Pinterest scroll. It looks really beautiful. Um, and then, um, I also offer albums as well. They're, the albums are not included unless I have some type of, um, like sale or promotion going on. I'm trying to get these sessions booked, then I will include them. Um, but with the album, I call them little black books. They are designed to be about their five by seven. Um, and they're the leather at, um, like they're not real leather, but they look like leather. They feel mm. like leather. And, um, and I usually have my, uh, my brides pick about, um, like 15 to 20 of their favorite images from the shoot, put them in the book. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, the reason why I love providing that and being kind of proactive about, in, about, you know, sharing more about the album is. A lot of my couples or my couples for weddings, but especially my brides for these boudoir shoots, they can't just take these photos of Costco and print them. Like they don't yeah. know what to do with them. And right. um, so, right. I agree. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I try to make it as easy and um, stress-free as possible for getting these high quality prints in their hands. 
And, and not only that, albums, uh, that's where you're going to make your money. I mean, just handing over digital pictures, unless you're charging an arm and a leg for them. And, and I think in, in the case of, of weddings and brides or all events, it's something tangible. Mm-hmm. You know, it's something that they can physically give to somebody that they can hold on to. And the truth of the matter is, and you'll know this, people, women look at these albums for years, you know, and they're, they're, I think that's a much better way to, to do it in, in prints or, or in albums than to, to hand over a bunch of digitals to to uh, somebody that's me personally and then what i do want to talk to you with a little bit is something you just brought up a couple of moments ago as far as privacy in the universe of boudoir now although you know things have changed over the past 10 years and now women are posting pictures of themselves everywhere <laughs> um this is still a big concern in that in that business so talk a little bit about how you handle that and how it should be handled yes so i am an advocate for privacy over profits. So at the end of the day, there is nothing that I wouldn't do to make sure, like put my life on the line status to make sure that um, my couples feel like their images are private. Um, so it starts with the gallery. So once the images are up, I have a actually like a two, um, like a two part uh, password collection, like little portal for them to see. Um, and then I also make it clear too, cause a lot of my, a lot of my brides will, um, like that's one of their biggest fear of even signing up for a boudoir is that privacy factor. So I go above and beyond to make sure that it's locked down. Um, also too, I, in through Pixie set, you can actually, so it's not just creating an, um, Sorry, I'm trying to find my words. Um, so it's not just finding like the password, but it's also like I can, link a specific email so nobody so even if you had the you had this specific the password link, yes if you had this like you know wi-fi status password um and then um but you need a specific email to even view the images and be even be able to download them so that right away is kind of like a an extra lock in lock and key um and then nothing ever gets shared. I give my my clients a two step um, process as well for being shared. So maybe before their shoot, they're a little nervous and they're thinking, "Oh no, absolutely, I cannot have my images shared. No way. Uh, uh-uh. um, you know, my husband will kill me, or that's just you know my job it doesn't allow it. I don't want right. to risk it." What I do is I send them um, through a private email. I send a couple, like three to five images that I loved from their shoot. And it, it's a, usually a face picture where them just smiling, looking happy, or maybe it's a sexy photo of them and, and their, their leg or their shoe or a piece of their garter. Where right. It's anonymous. Super anonymous. I mean, maybe their best friends can tell it's their ring, but that's about it. And, um, and then I make sure that they have that approval after. Because I feel like, and that's just general public in, in general. Like, you're not going to make a decision until you see something. Like, until you actually can see it for yourself. And, um, but yeah, so that's something I do. And then half the time they're like, or more than half the time, they're like, oh, yeah, I love these. This is so empowering. I want the world to see this. I want all my mm-hmm. girlfriends to do it. I'll share it. I'm happy to promote you. Like, I had such a great time. And their tune kind of changes. So, <laughs> So that's part of the, the yeah, and it, and it has changed, and and I remember even back that you, know, you couldn't tell it was under lock and key. You know, there were non disclosure agreements. It was so you know to even to do this was scandalous, and the idea of seeing a woman in a bra was like earth shattering. And I think you know the times have just changed a little bit, and it's not as as earth shattering as it used to be. But right, there are certain people who may be teachers or, or other jobs where really those photos, they don't want to be out into the public. So protecting their privacy is super important at the steps along the way. And there's lots of points of failure, uh, like you said, and you can only do what you can do once those photos are in somebody else's hands. You can't control what they do with them. Uh, but the important thing is to know, and I, I know this has happened to me, you know, which is photos I've, I've posted online. They wind up all over the place. Once you put something online, it gets copied, like you said, and I have photos that I took, uh, you know, 10 years ago of, of these people with, with tattoos that got onto Pinterest and got copied. And you know how people make memes out of them. Mm-hmm. They put words literally thousands and thousands and thousands of times. I found them on South American company websites. I found them oh all God. over the, you know, photos go, go everywhere. And uh, so, yeah, you really have to take, I think, those steps to make sure that these people are aware that it, that's great. And a lot of people will volunteer photos, like you said, because they're very excited about them. But as soon as those go on your website, you never know where they're going to wind up around the uh, around the universe. So it's important, I think, to make the people aware um, uh, before you do that to, to, you know, this is what may happen. It's just not going to be on my website. Someone's going to screenshot it or if you put it on your Instagram, people like repost them. 
And, you know, you're right. There's a lot of women who are happy to share that because they're excited about their their images. And you just have to ask first. You have to get that permission first. And I think anybody who's in boudoir has to have a good model release. And, uh, you know, but I used to you working with models to do sample photos at all or are most of them coming from your clients now, the ones that you display? Yeah. So um, the first one definitely was through a model um, for that quick little like mini workshop that I, mm. I did. Um, but a lot of them are my cousins and friends that recently got married right. that they're like, we just want to support you. Like I have no problem. <laughs> so they're yeah. happy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all, yeah. And, and a lot of people, like you said, now it's, you know, I, I, I do the same thing when I'm done with what some clients I'd ask them, Hey, you know, this is a really cute photo. Can, can we share it? And they're like, yeah, yeah, of course you can. You know, so I don't, I don't, you don't get that much resistance. You know, there's some people I don't ask just because I know from their jobs that it's right. not even worth my time, mm-hmm. teachers and doctors and stuff like that, uh, whatever, don't want to share, uh, their photos. But, uh, um, I think that is, I, I'm a user of Pixie set as well. And, you know, they have that password on there and also those galleries can be timed out. It's not a promotion for Pixie Set. I get paid by Pixie right. Set, but you know you could set those galleries to self destruct after a while, which is which is important, and the photos are just gone. And then also, I think what's important too is even after all that's done, uh, to inform clients about your long term storage options. Um, so, do you keep your clients' photos on your PC or, or laptop afterwards, or, or what do you do with them once they're once they're all done? Yes. Yeah, so I, I do store them online. So I do have, um, I do have, like, I, I keep them forever on Pixie set. Um, just because once again, I'm crazy. And for me, it's, you know, when, when I go through this process for a wedding day, one day, I'm like, I want to have access to these. Um, so I don't ever tell my clients that they get lifetime coverage or lifetime, mm. um, stuff. It's, it's up for a year after their wedding, but they never actually disappear. Um, and I keep them up there for a reason because I do offer annual promotions, annual sales where they can go in and they can order prints. Um, Pixie set has it all after the fact. Yes. Um, but I do, I archive a lot. I, um, I do, I have like tons of um, external hard drives and then I like kind of put stuff in the cloud as well. Um, there's, yeah, I, I, I just can't fathom like having images and then deleting them. Like, I just, I don't know. It's just weird. Like I can't. Yeah. Well, there's two points of, there's two points of view there. And again, it's not a right or a wrong uh, type of an answer because some people are so wary about them falling into the wrong hands. They'll tell people I'll keep them for six months. And then after that, I'm I'm just deleting them one because it's a business. It's a lot of money to store photos. It's a lot of maintenance. It's it's work to do and to maintain and hardware and so forth. So they just don't either have the money or, or the time or the, or the knowledge to go in to do that. That. And then also there's also the responsibility, I think, part of it where those can be loitering on a hard drive somewhere at home. And then in this day and age of computer viruses, too, you know, it may be no fault of your own. You can get something on there and indiscriminately somehow people could be taking those photos from your from your computer. So I think there's, uh, you know, I got into the habit of, of encrypting everything. Once my projects are done, those photos all get encrypted and I do store them. I'm one of those people, again, who store them for God knows how long and everything is encrypted and, and backed up on on hard drives in my pc and that's how i deal with it and i do that just because from every time to time like i just happened literally a month or so ago a woman contacted me for like four years ago she had some kind of a flood and i don't know how a mm-hmm. flood affected her computer but she lost all her images and she wanted to get a copy of her pictures from you know back in her session so that's where that comes in 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 useful i think in and hanging on to them just in case, you know, it doesn't happen all that often, but you, you can have them just in case somebody uh, um, comes to you and needs to, if a house burns and they lost their album or something like that, you can, uh, you can help them out in that, uh, in that situation. So that's what I do. Yeah. And you also mentioned that you do a lot of boudoir parties. Are you think you're an advocate of that more so than the, than the individual sessions or is it just really up to the preference of, of the person? Um, well, good question. I, I, I do love doing the, um, like the individual boudoirs and, um, but I've just noticed from a financial, like a business standpoint, um, it makes a lot more sense for me to do the petite boudoir sessions, like literally mini marathon days. Um, Mm -hmm. because then I have just one cost of the studio day. Um, and oh, sidebar, one tip I've just been totally tapping into is I've been reaching out to wedding venues to host boudoir shoots. Um, and they have been loving that because I could host a boudoir session, um, like on a Tuesday morning, for example, um, when the venue is typically 
closed. Yes, closed or just sleeping. Yeah. And um, and then of course the um, the you know the venue likes to promote those photos as well um, with you know of course permission of the bride um, for getting ready rooms and stuff like that. So side story, commercial break on that one. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that's interesting, and I, I would have never never thought about that. So you're going to local venues. And then using their facilities to to bring multiple brides in there to do their sessions right in yeah. that uh, right in that building. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and and your scenery is wonderful out there. I was looking at there's a lot of vineyards. It looks like and a lot of very it, it is. I would have ooh, that would be a great place to host um, host those sessions out there. Um, um, definitely. And you're right about doing those mini days because you can, the economy is the scale. You can just pay one rent. Mm-hmm. You could jam a bunch of people in and for shorter sessions. And the way I always looked at it too, and you mentioned earlier, you know, it's not always in everybody's budget to pay 1200 bucks for one session. So they still want to do it and you can accommodate them at a lower price. And, mm-hmm. you know, the only trouble I have, which I just had last weekend, I had a, a bunch of people coming in and that's why I look so exhausted, um, is that I'm very bad at staying on a timeline. Mm-hmm. I'm one of these people when I get going it just i have to have someone that's 130 next person it's 130 next person do you do the same way or no how do you structure those days to make sure you stay on time and, and on track um i stay pretty i stay pretty prompt um i for me i once again like just through all this crazy experience i understand that it takes time um you know to even though you've already predetermined outfits for example you've discussed it you know she stops at target on the way and she you know oh what do you think of these like everything takes mm. time a conversation takes time so typically for example um for like a half hour shoot if i am planning like a 25 to 30 minute photo shoot i actually give that bride the entire hour um so we aren't starting until about 10 15 minutes after um so for me i just i'd rather have that buffer time and create that experience so we're not rush 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 hurry up change oh you know this you know this these tops goes with these panties like switch well we forgot you know we're not rushing Um, and then too, what I like to do as well is I really love to create that experience. So it, it literally turns into a glam day, um, where I, you know, there's snacks out, um, there's, there's champagne and bubbly. Um, wow, it's a whole spread. Yes. And a lot of my, I'm coming to your minis. Yeah. Oh my gosh. They're so much fun. I wish you could, but yeah. And so, and even too, like I've even noticed, and my mom has always taught me this too. Like, you know, it's a good party when people don't want to leave. And I notice that a lot for my mini session days where, these brides, people are hanging around they're done like they're just lingering like and then what's cool too is that i'm bringing together these brides that maybe they don't know each other but they leave as friends and they're discussing wedding colors and wedding vendors and ideas and honeymoon locations and it turns into this kind of like incubator for um just like wedding conversations and um and i love being able to facilitate that yeah, it's, that sounds like it's a really good event. Now, what are your steps in bringing awareness about these events? How are you marketing these or, or what are you doing to, to draw these people in? Um, recently, it's been a lot of like, once again, word of mouth. And um, also too, now that I have been getting on board with with vendors, so I'm including my professional hair and makeup team, I have been hosting at wedding venues, um, I'm getting a lot of help to fill in these, these dates from these vendors as well, because they're, posting. they're sending you people. Yes. Oh, they're posting on yes. there. I gotcha. It's in social media is the game. So Facebook for me, and Instagram have really catapulted my business and Luckily, it, it costs me time. I spend a lot of time on Instagram. It's kind of embarrassing, but yeah. um, it does bring me clients. Yeah, and that's not bad. If you can have another venue promoting your events for you, and that's not going to cost you anything. That's uh, that's a win-win um, in that type of a situation. Um, that's for sure. Yep, absolutely. And especially, too, when, um, I mean, it's not even just like a, like a random golf course, for instance, right? I mean, this is a specific wedding venue. So of course, like their clients are brides, like we share the same clients. So mm-hmm. anytime we can tap into that for the cross promotion is key. Yeah, I think that's important in that building. She right, building those relationships. And then, you know, like you said earlier about your group, people are trying to support each other. That's a good way to to fill those spots. So how many women usually are you going to do on a, on a single day when you have an event like that? So I typically only will book, um, like when I open up registration, I only have, um, like four to six windows and, or, you know, time slots. And the reason why I do this, I learned this, um, just from the years of doing mini sessions, whether family shoots, um, or boudoir, um, is I actually have a very limited 
time slot. Like I only have like maybe four, let's just say four or five available times. So when people start booking and they start buying, for example, like just two people need to book and I can already start promoting, oh my gosh, halfway sold out. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and so then that way it's, you know, it still covers my, uh, my expenses that day. I still make profits. Um, but then as we get closer and more girls are aware of it and they want to book or maybe they're unsure once it first gets announced, um, then they book and it's no problem for me to add, you know, one or two sessions to the day. Um, I would just tack on. I'm like, oh my gosh. Since we can add another up, spot, we are adding one more spot. Yes. Well, that, well, that's a good way to do it. And that's a smart way, I think, to to promote those uh, events and, and keep them busy. So is that something you find yourself doing more of now or is or how often do you do these these uh, uh, minis? Um, well, this year I, I do them seasonally. So I like to do them about, about two to three times a year. Um, and for me, that's worked out. I feel like if I do them too often, people think, oh, well, I have a couple more pounds to lose. I'll do it next time. For example, that's always just like the, you know, woman thought process, which is, yeah, yeah, yeah. You understand. Um, and yeah, so I, I try to do them, um, about two to three times a year. Yeah, that's good. I think that's a that's a good amount for 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 mini sessions. And I want to change gears a little bit because I want you to talk a little bit about your education part of your job. And again, browsing through your website, you have something called the Styled Pop Up Series, and I see you you're promoting a lot of education. How did that start, or what are you doing on on that front as being an educator? Well, for me, I. Okay, so here's the thing with with photography and the wedding industry. Um, I I struggled with with education um, or with becoming an educator um, simply because everyone and their mother like that's like the new thing to do. I feel like to I have teach to, people, to teach right, people, yeah. and um, and so for me, for the longest time, I thought, who wants to learn from me? Like I, I mean, I have so much to learn. I I I am a no you know person to to offer my advice or my experiences. Um, but then recently, in the last couple of years. I really started honing in on like the client experience, for example. So um, my goal with my education is really teaching that um, kind of like kind of creating the foundation for your business and mindset. To me, I'm all about wellness and mindset um, with coming from not so much like the technical aspect. Like I feel like if you are a photographer, like you clearly know how to work your camera. Um, my education portion comes with, um, building that confidence and, um, really just turning your passion into your, um, profession. That's like to blanket everything. Um, whether that comes from experiences like live workshops, live mini sessions, um, one-on-one, um, consultations. Like I just want to be, I, in the photo industry, I laugh and I say, I just want to be your big sister to kind of give you that kick in the pants, um, to really chase your dreams and, um, to equip you with the tools to actually make profits. You're doing that for the, both the wedding and, and the boudoir uh, part of your business, both areas are being a mentor there? Uh, yes, yes. For me, it's just, and it's even kind of small business. So once again, here I am good in that generalist. Like, like, right, right. Just teach people how to run their photography business yeah, in general. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's important to do. And there's so many people who would really, really like to learn how to do that full time. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, they realize they fail to see how much work it actually is. But there's there's plenty, as you can see, there's plenty and plenty of people looking to learn about this business and jump in and uh, look like you do a real good job of 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 hosting these and, and teaching people. So, yeah. Hey, if that's another revenue stream that you can have and, and bring people in, um, why not? And I was looking at your video quick again on on the wedding one that you have on your website. And it looks like there's a lot of that, too, is just taking I saw people picking picking picture of the food spreads and stuff like that. So are you trying to um, teach people your style of doing work? And is that a big part of not just of the brides, but you said capturing the larger experience as far as these smaller details of, of what's going on at the wedding? Yeah, absolutely. So it kind of encompasses all things, whether it is, um, you know, capturing um, vendor photos. And um, but for me, it really is just making sure that if this is your business, like if this is where your heart is, like I can help you be successful. Like I can help you. Um, cause even today there are, um, you know, there's this like word on the street with um, photographers where if you're not getting paid. It's not worth it. And oh, like you need to raise your prices. And, and I'm once again, going to be completely transparent. There are even 
events and shoots today that I do pro bono, like absolutely for right. free, um, right. but strategically, right? So that's the part that I'm excited to teach. Um, as far as style, I, I teach photographers across the board, whether they do have that dark and moody look, um, whether they're attracted to um, just different styles. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that's the part where I come in where it's like, it's client experience. It's the foundation. It's, it's how are you communicating with your clients? It's how are you, um, creating that brand awareness? That's one thing I'm, I'm working on right now. I'm really focusing on, um, especially with all these crazy algorithms and the fact that our Instagram posts just are not getting seen anymore. How are you kind of creating that confidence to get out there and speak about your business to normal human beings, like at the grocery store or at your daughter's soccer game? How are you talking about your business in real life? And yeah, not- there's a lot of marketing yes. going on with yours. Yeah, that's the best way yeah. to describe all those jumble words I just said. Marketing. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, no. That you 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 said it perfectly. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, but people don't know where to go. They don't know where to start. They don't know the first steps to take. And it's it's you know it's it's stuff that takes a while to learn. Um, and you you kind of fumble through it. And of course, someone's looking to to. To, to do it a little bit easier. So I, I understand it. I mean, back when I started, there was no YouTube. There was nowhere really to go. You were, you just kind of threw yourself into the fire and kind of, you know, learned. Uh, uh, so why not? I, I, there was no one to turn to. There was no cl- online classes or anything then. So I think it's a great thing now that people can put together workshops, especially people who know what they're doing. I think, like, you know, there's a lot of people who, like you said, educators, I don't know what, who they're educating. I look at some of their things and I'm like, you don't, you know, but hopefully people do a little bit of homework and and realize that uh just i don't understand like when you see uh people you know selling the the secrets of boudoir a two dollar and 99 cent posing guide like that's going to change the universe i'd be a little little suspect uh banking my whole career on two dollars and 99 cents worth of information but uh, it's out there <laughs> yeah. that's what, it's what what people do but i think what you're doing is the right way i think it needs to be a hands-on kind of an experience an in-person experience because when whether it's showing like posing or whether you're you're teaching somebody how to to, to market with with brides or or bring people in it's not something you can necessarily do through a pdf file i think you have to meet with them and physically show them and it, it's a lot about demeanor it's a lot about how you talk to people and you can't pick up those things by just downloading a a PDF from a, um, from a web store, which is, which is fairly useless in a lot of instances. So I think for people like you're doing, I think that's a smart thing to do because not only can you start to grow a a revenue stream from that, uh, but I also believe it probably gives you a lot of satisfaction and that you're helping other people do something that they, that they really like to do as well. Yes. That's absolutely the core of why I have gotten into education and why I enjoy it so much. Now, is there ever, see, now this is one thing that I think of, um, cause I mean, two weeks ago I got a, and I don't, I don't really get them too much anymore, but I, I got an email from a, a young guy I said, Ooh, you know, can I please come and, and hang around with you and, and watch what you do and, and kind of learn a little bit from you and see my philosophy on that has always been, well, I, I look at it this way. I imagine maybe I have a cupcake shop. And I make the best cupcakes in town. And then, you know, someone comes in and they're like, oh, I I love your cupcakes. I love the frosting. And would you mind giving me the recipe? Because you see that shopping center right across the street? I was going to open my own cupcake store like right over there. And, and, you know, and you're like, so you're going to take my recipe and go and, (laughs) and, you know, I have kids in school and I got a morning and you're going to be handing over the money to somebody else. Does something like that ever pop up into your mind that you are doing these classes that now you're, you you could be, you know, uh, teaching somebody that may be sort of taking a little bit away from you or how do you handle that situation? That's a really great question. And I feel like once again, this is a topic we can talk for hours about. Um, but the first initial thing that comes to mind is, and this is kind of like the, the cupcake relation thing, right? Let's say, for example, because I'm totally a visual person, <laughs> obviously, um, let's say you did give that that recipe away, right? And you were like, okay, no problem. Welcome to the neighborhood. Like, this is what I do, right? And they took that recipe and they completely mimicked it. It was the exact same cupcake and they charge less, okay? Let's say that happened, okay? Well, in my opinion, this is why your photography needs to be on point technically and it needs to be like your work is going to speak for itself. But when you attach that experience, when you attach that, um, like that Pinterest hug. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. I know I sound like I. That's unique to you. Yes. It's unique to you. Um, for example, let's say in your coffee shop, 
you know, you have, you host events there and every time people go in there, they love the music. The music is different. Their friends go there and, you know, there's referrals and, um, you, there's just like, there's this entity, like there's like this, there's this tangible thing that you cannot touch that is so incredible about your, about your cupcake shop. Um, or for example, like your photography business, um, that people just cannot duplicate. They can not duplicate you. So by creating those experiences and um, leaving people wanting more and wanting to come back and tell their friends about you and, and your photography, um, that to me is is what is going to create that longevity in your business. So, I mean, even look at our stuff, right? For example, photographers across the board, we, we're all using Pixie Set or, you know, we're using um, very similar programs. We are using very similar cameras, if not the same bodies, the same lenses. Um, we are using, you know, Lightroom and Photoshop and the same exact programs. They're all cookie cutters. Like they're literally cupcakes. That's the best way to, like, that's the best way to describe mm, it. Right, and right. Um, when you have these cupcakes, um, you know, what makes them different? And um, that to me is what I'm so excited to, to help educate photographers on is creating those experiences and those those, those touch points that make your clients, even clients that you don't even know, um, which is where I'm excited to be teaching more about videos and um, more like client intake um, stuff to make them see you online and kind of turn, like you mentioned before, like that PDF into real yeah. life and to make them feel like mm. they know you and they trust you before they even even see so, your work. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So you've, you've taught me here something today. So you're saying by teaching somebody even the mechanics something, they still can't be me. No. They have to develop their own thing and do their own thing. Yes. So it's bigger than just taking a photo and it's bigger than just a recipe. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to this business than just the mechanics of it. There's a lot of personality. There's a lot of style that isn't necessarily going to be duplicated by somebody else. So Absolutely. there you go. Absolutely. So that's a great answer to that. And what I want you to do, we've been on almost an hour here this morning, so I want to uh, um, let you get back to the rest of your day. But I want to let you know, where can people find you? Uh, where can we find you online? Where can people find out a little bit about your classes? Or where do you want everybody to go? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you can find me on my website, which is key, uh, www kiana marie it's q u i a n n a marie.com and also on instagram i hang out a lot on instagram so i'm always in my insta stories sharing adventures um which is also just kiana marie online yep and and that's where they can find you yeah all over. that's perfect do it people do it <laughs> thank you're, you you're very smart See? you're very smart thank you i can tell by talking to you you know what's going on oh my so gosh. keep up the good work with that keep up your workshops and I uh, just want to thank you for taking uh, the time today to come on and talk to everybody. And it was great information. So hopefully everybody was listening today. And uh, I appreciate it. Thanks for taking your time with me. Thank you so much. This is really fun.